Okay, thank you so much, Deidre. Thank, thank you for the opportunity to visit with you today. I'm gonna to share a, kind of a collection of, of things that we've learned about managing fusarium dry rot through the years. And hopefully, there we go. Just a little bit of background. Uh, for those of you who may not know uh, about us at Miller Research, we, uh, this was a, a business that was established in 1977 by my father, Terry Miller. And we're located here in South Central Idaho. And uh, we conduct mostly contract research for different companies. But we also do our own original research, which has been sponsored by the Potato Commission, um, mostly in Idaho, but recently in the tri-state. We also do cooperative research projects with different universities. And our mission is to provide just sound, unbiased information um, for agriculture, primarily around disease control. We do a lot of trials testing efficacy of different products but we also do some that are looked at, are designed to detect the residue of different uh, pesticides in food. So that if a grower is out using a certain pesticide and then that potato makes its way into the, uh, the Happy Meal at McDonald's, are you gonna be eating that or not? And so those are some of the, the, the trials that we do. I will, uh, I try to post information on social media from time to time, um, somewhat active on our Facebook page um, we also have a, a Google group where I send out uh, different things about potato disease management and uh, it's an email list. If any of you are interested in being on that and you're not, let me know. And we have a web page where I post a lot of our presentations and the work that's been funded by the potato commissions. I thought it'd be good to let you know, as I, as I talk about this research, I think it's important for you to know what the growing conditions are. We're a very sandy location. Um, it's about 75 to 80% sand, and then the rest is, is split between silt and clay. And it's very, very common in our area to grow uh, potatoes, followed by sugar beets, and then a small grains. Uh, sometimes there's a bean crop in there. Um, three year rotation. Potatoes, once every three years, is fairly common. Growers will try to go to four years if they can. And, and as you go to the, more of the, the western side of the state, the rotations do tend to get longer. As you go to the eastern side of Idaho, the rotations get shorter. And in fact, um, we've had cases where some people are growing potatoes back to back. That's not a desirable situation, but um, in some cases it has been done. If you try to deal with the reality of not having a lot of rotation crops here in the Snake River Plain. For right where I'm at in the middle of the state, planting typically occurs in the first part of April. Um, for us, from a research standpoint, we're usually starting right around the 20th of April, and then we'll begin harvest around September 15th. Still in our area, most of the acreage is Russet Burbank, but it is diversified a little bit with newer Russet varieties that have, that have come on the market. And I'll talk about some of those today. This is a, a, a drone image of our research field. And um, we have uh, eight rows two four row plots side by side followed by two drive rows and most of what we do is under pivot irrigation and so this is just a view of our plots we we they're 30 feet long and uh we're on 34 inch rows but you can see what our field looks like and each one of those units we will manage uh, differently depending on the treatment that's being involved i want to talk about fusarium dry rot and, and first talk about the different species that cause dry rot Fusarium sambucinum is probably the most common uh, throughout North America. We look at different uh, research studies that are published. They will often cite this as the, the most commonly isolated um, of the species. And these are some different pictures that show what it can look like. And what I want to point out with Fusarium sambucinum is the infection typically is not uniform across the potato. There tends to be this, uh, this variability, or, or it almost looks like the, the fungus, it's channeling its way through the potato for whatever reason. So you'll get areas of infection surrounded by areas that are, are pure and healthy. And that's different from Fusarium ceruleum. And this one is not as widespread, but it is still fairly common. And here in Southern Idaho, we see this quite a bit. If you look at the, the potato, these are daughter tubers harvested at the end of the season. Here you can see that the infection is, is some more uniform across the potato. Where cerulean really becomes a problem is in seed pieces. And it tends to be much more damaging there because it's faster growing than sambucinum and it can take the seed out before the plant has a chance to get started. Now there are a lot of other fusarium that are able to 
cause dry rot. And um, there's been studies that have been in different places looking at those. Uh, here in Southern Idaho, we primarily see those two, the Sambucinum and the Cerulean. And I just, for an example, put a picture of Fusarium graminiarum, and I got this from Gary Secourt, North Dakota State. Uh, in some ways, it looks a little bit like cerulean, but also a, a little bit like sambucinum. Um, in this picture over here, it's more of a lighter brown color. And, and there are many others. In fact, there's some work going on right now at the University of Idaho where they're doing survey work to see what are the different species that we see now that change. Yes, the big question is, does it really matter? Um, if the seed, is seed or the daughter tube is decaying, shouldn't that be enough? Well. The reason why it may matter is that sambucinum is primarily a storage issue, at least we see. It became resistant to the, resistant to the benzimidazole, benzimidazole fungicides, sorry as I can't talk, back in the 80s. In fact, I was growing up on my father's research farm and, and we cut a lot of seed pieces at that time. Um, TBZ was one of the main seed treatments that was used back then. Uh, it was also formulations of tops. And then uh, growers could spray Mertec. Um, which I believe is still labeled, but Mertec would be a post-harvest spray. The problem would be the seed grower might put TBZ on, and then they might treat the harvested seed with Mertec. Then it would go to a commercial grower, and they might do the same thing. So the same uh, potatoes would be have, have multiple shots of the benzimidazole fungicide. So it didn't take long before uh, resistance developed. And it got to the point where if you were using one of these benzimidazole fungicides, it would make fusarium dry rot worse. Now, there has been resistance to fludioxinil that's also reported. Um, we have a, a confirmed report of it here in Southern Idaho also. It's not as widespread though, but it is building. And that I'll talk about that later. Um, it can grow faster than cerulean um, in storage, but not in the soil. And it is be very problematic with pre-cut seed. Now, cerulean is more damaging in the field. And I have a little photo down here again, comparing the two. Um, side by side. It grows faster in the soil, but we haven't seen fungicide resistance with it, and it's not very common in storage. I guess the good thing about the cerulean is it, it, it's not as near as universal as sambucinum is. We just don't see it quite as often. Looking at the disease cycle, if you start with seed tubers that have fusarium in the lower left-hand corner of the screen, that seed, the spores, can go from the, insect, the infected seed and infest the daughter tubers and then get released into the soil. And then as the tubers become wounded at harvest, the, the daughter tubers can become infected and then the dry rot can develop quite quickly, uh, particularly between 60 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And if those tubers are stored, again, if seed tubers, that would perpetuate the cycle. There is, um, I think, enough evidence to, to say that the amount of fusarium you have in the seed can be indicative of what you could expect at harvest, but there are other factors that will play into that. So how do you prevent it? What are the different tools that you have to, to manage fusarium in the fusarium toolbox? As I mentioned, the seed is important, so get seed with as little dry rot as possible. Um, you can sterilize cutting equipment. There have been a number of studies done showing that. And also sharpen the seed cutting knives. And these are studies that were done almost 80 years ago. People would look at um, knives that were either sharp or that had been dull. And um, as the knives are, are, are sharper, you get a cleaner cut. The tuber tends to heal a little faster and then they have less fusarium infection. Now, number four, I'm, I'm gonna come back and talk more about that this in a minute, avoid pre-cutting if possible. There's a lot of good reasons why a seed grower, like a potato grower would pre-cut. And um, I'll put a caveat on that. I would use that if you're really dealing with a significant fusarium problem, because sometimes the benefits of pre-cutting are, are good enough that if you, if you don't have a fusarium issue, pre-cutting is a good thing to do. And it may offer other benefits. Um, we can use seed treatments, and I will spend the majority of my time talking about those. And anything we can do to minimize ruining at harvest will minimize the amount of fusarium decay that we have in storage. There's a pretty good correlation between that. And we can do post-harvest treatments with stadium. I have a question mark there because this is uh, by no means an established, or I should say a universal recommendation that can be made. Um, there are significant export issues with stadium. So any potatoes at all that are being produced that are gonna be exported to Pacific Rim uh, countries, 
most likely cannot be treated as staging um, due to the MRL issues. Potatoes that are grown that are only going to be consumed in the United States can be treated, and uh, Stadium has had some good success in managing um, fusarium dry rot in those situations. But even then, at least some of the processors have, have backed off that a little bit, saying, we're not always sure. There may be times when we don't know if the crop, where it's going to end up eventually. So as a result, there's been some hesitation to, to use that. And we'll talk more about that. So I talked about pre-cut versus cutting and planting. And so this is seed that had been um, inoculated with Fusarium sambucinum. And this is the one that, that's um, really important in storage. And you think about that, when you pre-cut it and you put the seed back into storage, under those conditions, the sambucinum grows faster. We have a check, the check plot, we're having 89% of the seed tubers were uh, infected. When I used Mancozeb dust, I was able to drop that to 44% in my pre-cut seed. Still pretty high. With POPs, which, was, which is a benzimidazole seed treatment, I'm at 73. And then with polyram, which in essence, we're using a liquid Mancozeb type seed treatment. We're up at 100%. So pre-cutting and storing put the, the seed tubers at a lot greater risk. We could compensate for that somewhat with the use of Mancozeb dust, but we still had a lot of disease. Now, if I cut and directly plant, um, I have almost no disease in the check, even though I've inoculated with fusarium. Um, the Mancozeb still at zero. Now there was a little bit with the tops and the polyram. And um, again, this goes to the idea I mentioned earlier that when you're dealing with benzimidazole resistance, sometimes the use of those products like tops can make it worse. Now with polyram, um, I'm not sure all the reasons why this is, but multiple growers have reported that when they've used a liquid base, or the liquid Mancozeb based product, it has not worked the same as it does. And so we're gonna come back to that idea later on in the presentation, but it's something that's at least to keep in mind. Now, if we do that same experiment using Fusarium ceruleum, we have different results. Um, Pre-cutting and storing, not a problem at all if I was treating with MZ dust or if I was treating with, with tops, good control. Um, if I cut and then direct plant directly, um, I, I get a little more with Mancozeb or with tops. So um, the risk of pre-cutting, not as big of a deal if we're dealing with ceruleum. But as I mentioned before, Sambucinum is the most common fungus and uh, it tends to be more problematic. Now, if we look at uh, the amount of disease that we have on the seed tubers versus what we see in the daughter tubers, um, we see there does appear perhaps to be somewhat of a correlation. So you see with the Mancozeb dust, we were able to reduce it um, a little over 50%. We had a little bit lower disease in the daughter tubers. It was not significant in this, but that trend seems to follow through in several studies that we've done. So if you ask the question, well, which seed treatment should I use then? That's one place where growers probably have the most uh, degrees of freedom, at least the most opportunity to, to make a choice. Some of these other options may not be available to you. I mentioned Mancozeb dust. It's been around for a long time. It's very effective. Uh, there was a point in time where um, I just need to back up and say occasionally we're called out to do our consulting in fields when growers have a problem. They may have a, a stand issue or a seed decay problem. And at one point in time, I felt pretty confident saying that whenever we had a fusarium problem, almost always they did not use mechanism dust in the seed treatment. They may have used a different dust treatment like a bark or uh, maybe they had used uh, say a, a liquid without a dust. And so we felt pretty confident that that magnet of dust was a, was a good option. However, there are a lot of issues with using dust. I think anyone who's been around it knows it's very problematic. Uh, it is a, a significant worker health issue. Uh, it's got to the point where growers who are using dust, I, I know one, one large operation they've set up where they have all their seed cutting uh, equipment in, in one um, storage bay. And then they have a line of conveyors. Once the seed is cut and treated with the liquid seed treatment, then they move the potatoes all the way over to a whole different storage unit where they can add the dust and they try to keep their workers out of it because it, you, you get it everywhere. Um, and even the rate you put on, you don't get it all on. So that's been the attraction with using liquid things. Now there are, there are liquid mancozebs and this is different say from the polyram. There's actually a seed treatment that's formulated um, startup M MANZ. Um, with flutioxanil, 
It's another active ingredient. There's a number of different um, formulations out there. I don't know if I have them all on here. I'm not trying to say one's better than the other. These are some of their, their most common. Um, Syngenta had just a straight Maxim, which was a liquid. Then they had the Maximum Z, which was a dust formulation. And then they have their Cruiser Max uh, potato uh, formulations, and there's several of those. Spirato is another one, and then Startup Flutie. Uh, diphenaconazole is another active ingredient that can be active. It is active against fusarium. And that is found in Cruiser Max Potato Extreme and also in the Syngenta's newest iteration, Cruiser Max Vibrance. So the Vibrance is simply the Cruiser Max Potato Extreme, and then they've added another fungicide in there, which a uh, group seven, an SDHI fungicide, which does not appear to be active against fusarium, but it is active against Rhizoctonia. And that's the reason for including that. And then we also have another triazole, prothiaconazole, which is included in Emesto silver. And Emesto is a combination of the triazole and also an SDHI fungicide, a penflupin, but that is not thought to be effective against dry rot either. So I'll talk a little bit about the seed treatments, how they work. Um, this is comparing um, alder bark to maximum Z. This, was, this trial was done quite a long time ago, but we did this because at the time, a lot of growers were only using bark. And the idea is the bark would help um, dry the, the cut seed surface. It would help it heal quickly. We found that it had no effect whatsoever on managing fusarium. You had to have an active ingredient like the Maxim or the Mancozeb. Another question is, what if I use uh, an inferral spray? And we know azoxystrobin, actually, which is Quadris now, um, it was labeled as a seed treatment for a time. And I think they called it Dynasty. And it actually worked pretty good as a seed treatment. But there were some um, non-target effects from the plant in certain areas of the United States that caused problems, or at least growers felt that the Dynasty was causing issues with the emergence. And so that was pulled from the market and they went back to using Quadra simply as an inferral spray or foliar spray. We found when we spray and furrow, this is somewhat similar to what Lydia pointed out in her talk, your, your inferral spray, you're, you're probably getting some of the, the fungicide on the seed piece and then the soil that's going to be around it, but it's not enough to control the disease. You really need to have um, an active ingredient on, coating on the seed. And the rate becomes important. Now, even though these are statistically similar, looking at max and 4FS at the 0.04 ounce rate, the 0.08, um, statistically similar, but this trend is, is we've seen repeated many times. And um, we worry that because these are expensive, sometimes growers will cut the rate. You know, say, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go down just a little bit because I wanna spread my, my seed treatment farther. And the problem is that when we start to cut the rates, we probably won't get the same level of performance that we would if we're using the full labeled rate on that. This is another graph showing the same thing about the, the, the rate issue. Here's maximum 0.04 versus maximum 0.08. And again, it's about half at the higher rate. And here's quadrus and furrow on this side, not, not working as well. I mentioned about you know, the pre-cut versus the cutting. Um, there is a big move to get rid of the dust altogether and say, can we just go to a liquid uh, approach to this? So the CMV stands for Cruiser Max Vibrance. And that's these two, this, this row right here and the brown in the back represents seed that's been pre-cut and stored for three weeks. And then the blue in the front represents seed that's been cut and planted directly. And we didn't, we didn't have all the treatments for the cut and plant, but we have the Cruiser Max Vibrance Cruiser Max Vibrance with Mancas of Dust. Here we have Cruiser Max Potato. So it has the, the diphenaconazole, but not the, or I'm sorry, this has, does not have the diphenaconazole. It, it's just the Maxim. And then we have Emesto Silver and then just MZ Dust alone. And what we see here, look at this statistically with the Cruiser Max Vibrance, um, they were statistically similar, whether we pre-cut and stored or whether we cut and plant. So we didn't see a difference in the amount of disease there. The same adding that the mancas have dust. But one thing about this is the level of disease is lower. So still including that dust into the system was effective. Now, when I use just the fluty oxenil alone, the Cruiser Max potato, um, I have generally more disease. And that is a little worrisome. As I mentioned, there has been a report of fluty oxenil resistance here in our area. And so it's something to watch that it may be spreading to other areas. 
Now, imestyl silver in this trial, at least with the pre-cut, worked very, very good. Mancozeb alone pre-cut was uh, statistically similar to some of those others. So all of those worked well. Now, that was in um, one year. We repeated the trial the next year. And even, I would say, got better results. And this is, this is actually with natural inoculum. So we're not inoculating the system. And here, the pre-cut and the stored, all of the treatments worked very well. And uh, those that were cut in plant, the Cruiser Max did not. So this made us wonder, are we seeing resistance to fluoxanil? Um, and I think that's a, a very good likelihood. Now, this shows the yield, because at the end of the day, that's what really matters, the marketable yield of tubers. And we actually had a significant increase by using pre-cut seed. And this isn't a new observation, it's one that we've seen before. Um, this is Russell Burbank. I should have said that earlier, but so by pre cutting, we can generally have an increase in yield. And that was statistical with the Cruiser Max Vibrance and the Cruiser Max Vibrance plus the MD. We've done a test recently looking at uh, several different russet cultivars to see how do they vary in their susceptibility to dry rot. Now we know that there are some that are highly susceptible. In fact, it seems like some of the newer cultivars that have been released. The newer russet cultivars are very susceptible. So in the back, the orange bars along the back wall represent those that are not treated at all. So we took the seed just as it came. So to some degree, there is going to be an effect of the background um, low inoculum load on the seed. Planted out, and then some we treated with Cruiser Max Potato Extreme. And that is the one that has the, the Bluteoxanil and the Diapeniconazole. With the non-treated, we had significant decay with our Ranger and our Umatilla. Now, clear water, uh, this is the one that all growers worry about. In fact, we've had growers say that they'll plant extra seed because they know they're gonna lose some of it in the field due to dry rot. So we actually expected clear water to be significantly higher than it was here. Uh, what we attribute this to is the fact that we probably got a seed lot that had a very low level of fusarium. But regardless, when we went and added the, uh, the seed treatment to the, the seed, we had very good control in this case across all of now Umatilla, we didn't get as good a control as we would hope with some of the others, but most of the others were, were, were very good control. This looks at um, CP's decay incidence. We, so we, we took the clear water and said, we, we'd like to see how it performs maybe under inoculated conditions because that's the one that most growers complain about. So here we have clear water inoculated with fusarium sambucinum and then treated with a bunch of different seed treatments. So over here on the far left, we have an untreated control, which was not inoculated, and one that was, and we had a significant increase by our inoculation. But this time, the seed, the seed lot that we picked had a fairly high background level of, of fusarium in it already. Now, when I use Mancozeb dust under inoculated conditions, I brought it back down to basically the non-inoculated state. Same with Cruiser Max Vibrance. Combine the Cruiser Max Vibrance with the Mancozeb, it gets an even uh, an additional decrease. But we didn't see the same control if you messed o, you messed o with Mancozeb or with Burbark. And this just shows the severity of the decay and it follows a trend very similar to the incidence. Incidence is really what matters the most because if a seed piece of decay is decayed, it's not gonna be very good. So summarize what I've talked about. Um, seed treatment products combined with Mancozeb dust really are offering the best protection. Uh, and if you're gonna use a liquid one, the rate is important. We encourage growers not to cut the rate. Um, we, I know it's been done, but we don't want to do that. If you're just using bark only as a way to cure that cut seed tree, that cut surface, that's not an effective way to manage these areas of dry rot. And the infero fungicides don't work. Uh, dust may be eliminated. It may be the choice taken away from us. And if that's the case, it, it won't matter. So we are looking more at these liquid Mancozeb treatments to see if they can be a replacement for that. So I have this slide, I'm not gonna go over it. It just talks about the different uh, uh, seed treatments that are available out there, at least that I'm aware of. I tried to be as um, thorough as I could searching for this. And it shows, you know, the form of dust or liquid, what group, what fungicide resistance actually, what the frat group that it falls into and what the combinations are. Just a word about post-harvest sprays. 
you know, we used to use Mertec, which was a benzaminazole fungicide to spray the tubers as they went into storage and used to be quite effective since it is, then it is not. So with Dr. Nora Olson at the University of Idaho, we've done a number of post-harvest uh, challenge studies where we will inoculate potatoes with fusarium and then treat them um, with different post-harvest sprays. So one that we've worked a lot with here in Idaho is phosphorus acid. Uh, Dr. Olson and I were the ones who got the crazy idea to try it in the first place about almost 20 years ago. Found that it worked really, really good in controlling pink rot and late blight. Doesn't seem to work on dry rot at all. And uh, the AZO, that's the Zoxystrobin or Quadris. We looked at combining that with the FOSS acid. That didn't help using just Mancozib alone. Here's the, the thiabendazole with the Zoxystrobin. And uh, nothing is doing any better than the entry control. So none of these were working. Well, as we worked with this, uh, we thought there's got to be a way for, maybe, maybe there's other products that we could find that would, that would help. And so this led to a, going back to this variety study, we thought, let's take, let's see if we can take the decay that we have um, coming out of the field and we'll overlay that with a post-harvest spray. So I'll try to go through this as fast as I can. The, the tan yellow bars in the back represent um, non-treated plants. The blue bars represent those that receive that seed treatment I mentioned, the, the cruiser max to extreme with dust. And after harvest, we took the potatoes and created any that had more than 5% decay. So with the Burbank and the Ranger, we had a fair amount. With Umatilla, we had some, and also with Clearwater and Dakota. Not much with Narcota, Alturas, and Teton. Then we took those and exposed them to a post-harvest treatment of stadium. So when we did that, again, the same type of response, whether the fungus, whether they were treated or not, sorry, whether they had a seed treat or not, um, we did see a reduction in dry rot with uh, Russet Burbank here, a significant drop when it was treated with stadium. The same with Ranger. We didn't see that with Nor Norcota or Alturas, but again, those were very, very low to begin with. Using stadium on Umatilla had a significant reduction, as it did with the Clearwater and the Dakota. So for some of these varieties that are maybe more susceptible, like Umatilla and Clearwater, using a post-harvest spray like stadium would be effective. And you know, stadium is a three-way mixture. It's got um, fludioxanil, azoxystrobin, and diphenoconazole. And it's the diphenoconazole that's carrying the lion's share of the work on those. So with that, I guess, I hope I haven't gone over time, but I'd be happy to stop and take any questions. And I do have some references that we used um, in putting this together. And um, anyway, be happy to answer any questions.